uh, advances in geosciences give us really good uh, methods to start analyzing pigments, start analyzing uh, pigments as an archaeological material, so we can start telling um, uh, what what pigments are made of. So this uh, so-called dugong from Gula Tambun, uh, that's a close-up of the of the hematite flakes. We've been able to do um, XRD studies on the pigments and find a very distinct titanium oxide signature with the, with the hematite, and we've been able to match the titanium oxide signature with local sources of hematite. So we know precisely where uh, these people got their, their ochre sources from. Um, these are a couple of my colleagues from ANU, uh, Christian on the left and Jacob on the right. Uh, what they're doing there with their Star Trek ray gun is they're shooting uh, X-rays onto the onto the rock art to determine the elemental uh, uh, makeup of these pigments, uh, which has which has some useful applications. We we found that not all black drawings are necessarily charcoal; they may be manganese. And so, if you if we're thinking of sampling charcoal for rock art, we've got to make sure that that's really charcoal. Uh, and so PXRF might be a very good way to, to determine whether um, samples are, are worth something or not. Um, dating and chronology. Now, um, rock art, as any archaeologist will tell you, uh, is notoriously hard to date. Yeah, unless, it's, uh, unless it's charcoal drawings, uh, which you can possibly carbon date, most of the rock art tends to be made of iron oxide and water. Uh, totally undateable. We do have uh, maybe one or two uh, published dates for published direct dates in the Cup of East Timor in the Lena Hara cave, um, which puts the rock art to about uh, at, at oldest 27,000 years old, and that's surprisingly old. Uh, and the other dates are about 13,000 to 7,000, which is still surprisingly old. Um, and and it does it does uh, lend weight to the idea that rock art does tend to be uh, older than we think it is. Uh, we do have some unpublished dates right, for the rock art in Malaysia that uh, Chen was talking about, and um, I hear that they might be even as old as a thousand years old. So that's that's quite surprising too. Um, we have dating by association. These are the Pandalin caves in uh, Myanmar, which was there two weeks ago, um, and we have here in this cave a long, a long uh, stone tool workshop. Uh, that was used for a very long time, and this is the only archaeological material that we have here. This this material has been dated to about uh, thirteen thousand or seven, seventeen thousand or uh, no thirteen thousand and seven thousand years old. And there are some of the tools that are stained red uh, from grinding, and we have we have uh, rock art there, red colored rock art, and we have direct associations with with uh, the stone tool and yard. So we also get yes another seven thousand year old date or thirteen thousand year old. Um, the the boat coffins and Gulakai Hitam, which are in association with um, the ship of the dead paintings, the coffins have been carbon dated to be a thousand years old. So again, a good a good antiquity, a, a good uh, association and a good date association as well. Um, when you have a large data set like the one that I worked in, uh, worked in in, uh, in Kuantan, um you can start working superimpositions within. Uh, the rock art. So if one rock art was paint, one one painting was painted over another, you know that the one on top was more recent. And we go to Tambun where I've had 640 paintings. Uh, we have a really really good sense of uh, paintings, uh, the order of paintings. So we have uh, orange or red paintings that were first followed by purple paintings. Uh, and the last stage was this um, totally different set of paintings called the X-ray X-ray deer paintings. But what's interesting about this chronology is that the, the painters of this site, uh, first they, they started with large paintings and then they gradually reduced in size over time, uh, which is, which is, which is counterintuitive counter if you think that they'll start small and then, and then won't be later. And then the other, the other point is that they started high, so they were painting like 12 meters off the ground before they started going down. And you think, again, they might start lower before going higher. And, and that's an insight that you would not have gotten if you hadn't been looking at this at a high resolution. Uh, and it suggests also a, a lot about the ways they, they produce these paintings. If these paintings are 12 meters high, what kind of technology would they have to use? They have to build a scaffold, they have to, uh, uh, if the paintings were uh, more than two meters wide, they, they 
tend to have both hands free to be able to paint that kind of uh, painting. Um, other forms of dating, uh, and this, this is particularly for histori historic work art. Um, this is a thumb, thumb Viking. If you're not going to pick it, you might have, you might have passed by there. The, the boat tours always give you, a, give you this right uh, past Thumb Viking. It looks like this from the outside. From the uh, you can't go in the cave, but if you go in the cave, uh, you'll see uh, spectacular about 80 ships uh, over there. And these ships are, are extremely dateable. You have, you have some Thai junks, you have Chinese junks, you have uh, European mastic ships. Um, this is an example of a Dutch schooner, and that, that puts these paintings to be um, no earlier than the 16th or 17th century. So um, dating by iconography. Um, in another site in uh, Langkawi, Goa Charita, there's two chambers. Um, paintings uh, that you can't really see here, but this is not the one I'm interested in. Uh, there are prehistoric paintings as well as uh, Arabic script, uh, which can be dated. But this, this is my favorite painting of all. It's a picture, a picture of a car, and, and from the angular design, I wonder if it's a proton saga. Uh, so 1980s of a painting, really good, really good chronology for, for this painting. Um, and, and sometimes you're really lucky and you can get a, get a site that you can date to within a year, which you can't even do with carbon dating. And this is the Nian Cat. Uh, the Nian Cat is, is this, this YouTube uh, sensation that you can listen to in your own time. Um, but it first came out in 2011, and I was at this site in 2012, so you know that this painting was there within the last 12 months. Uh, so you can't get a, a clearer chronology than that. And, and yeah, it's only very recent, but maybe 50 years and I can, I can say yes, I know exactly when this painting was drawn. Uh, related to the idea of uh, iconography is the, uh, uh, the idea of cultural context. So uh, this is my colleague Daryl Wesley, and he's worked in uh, rock art in north of Australia. And um, they have depictions of um, uh, Indonesian ships, Makassan ships, coming, to, coming in contact with the Aborigines. Um, that, that put uh, put contact period 100 years before published historical sources. So um, again, rock art can overturn what is going through historical sources. Uh, this is the painting uh, that Chen mentioned about in, in Nungong. Uh, it's a painting of a bicycle and a buggy. It's not very good now. It's degraded a lot since it was first published in 1920. And of course, uh, uh, cultural context. This is a painting of uh, what is supposed to be the Om uh, in southern Thailand, but anyone who knows Sanskrit knows that this isn't an Om. Um, so I'm not sure what this what this means, but it does show some cultural context with, with India. Um, lastly, we're going to start looking at uh, patterns in the landscape. Um, and, and even with this incomplete map, you can start seeing some, some interesting patterns in the landscape. Uh, first, handprints and stencils tend to appear with great frequency in the eastern Indonesian islands, and that continues down into Australia. Um, why is that so? We're not sure, but that's, that's an interesting uh, distribution there. Megaliths appear all throughout the Indonesian islands. That's another interesting, and you find very few uh, similar megaliths in mainland Southeast Asia. Uh, in fact, the only main megalith set that you know in Southeast Asia, mainland Southeast Asia is the Pain of Juras. <coughs> and petroglyphs only appear uh, with great frequency in the northern part of Southeast Asia, the coastal parts. So um, uh, Vietnam, Hong Kong, Hainan, uh, and Philippines, which may or may not be um, a, a site that were included in this, in this group. Um, so some, some key points that I want to uh, uh, make at this point. The rock art research is really under, underdeveloped in Southeast Asia. Uh, we, need, we need better recording methods. We need uh, to start, start looking at this as uh, data sets, seeing, seeing unseen uh, pictures, because they also have a, a very important conservation uh, use. You need good recordings so that you can compare, compare them in, in later times to see how much they've degraded over time. Um, I, I've actively not put examples outside of Southeast Asia, but uh, 
Um, outside of Southeast Asia, we have um, interesting um, uh, studies to characterize pigment sources. Uh, uh, that's being done in Spain, in South Africa, we've got ethnographic examples to show how uh, trans states and shamanism fit into the creation of Rocca. Um, there's been work on hand stencils in, uh, and in, in France in biometrics to talk about uh, the, the gender divide in, um, in rock paintings looking at the hand stencils. And you find that there is an equal amount of uh, male and female handprints on, uh, in, the, in the French rock art. And also handedness. We find that uh, right handedness in human beings uh, even existed with the Neanderthals. Uh, with the with the French rock art, and, and that, that uh, you wouldn't have thought of it, but that kind of information comes from from rock art studies. We also have to start looking at um, beyond single sites and start looking at sites in clusters or regions, um, and and that's that's where my work comes in, uh, which starts with the rock art of Phnom Kulen in uh, Cambodia. So Phnom Kulen is. Uh, about 40 kilometers, 30 or 40 kilometers north of Angkor. Um, not really clear here, but this is Angkor Thom and Angkor Wat in the bottom. And Phnom Kulen is this large plateau over here. Um, it is the most holy place of Cambodia. It's linked to the foundation of the Khmer Empire when Jaya Baba II in the year 802 either instituted the, the, the god king cult or made himself the king of the gods, um, translation to the Pazi. Um, and Rock art has been only found there in the last two years. It's very, very recent, and it's something to blow people's minds that there is rock art uh, in the in the Angkor region, and it's been found by my colleagues in the Upsara Authority and uh, uh, by the Archaeology Development Fund, uh, who work on the land itself. So it's it's not it's not my discovery, but they've let me um, they've let me do the recordings for these sites. Um, what do these sites look like? Um, the typical sandstone shelters, Funko, uh, this one, was formed by the Amsara Authority. Um, there are about 12, 12 sites that we know so far, and they're all located in the northeast or eastern foothills of Korea. The kinds of uh, paintings that we have uh, are really typical of uh, the rock art in Southeast Asia. We have a lot of gold uh, this in a, a so-called X-ray style. Another kind of bullet here, you can see the horns very clearly, but the rest of the body is not very clear. Um, anthropomorphs, again in the same, so human human shapes. Um, and this this is quite unique, I haven't seen anything else like it around. And uh, this spiral shape, and, and take a look out for this because uh, it has links to the next site. Uh, Punta Kat, which is on Phnom Kulen itself, was discovered by the Archaeology and Development Fund Foundation, and they, they let me record this site uh, in July. And you can see these are modern these are modern statues there. Um, they were put up there in the last last five years, and the rock art is located behind this shelter. Uh, the Ganesha is modern, but you can see beside Ganesha, um, there are paintings on the wall. Uh, again, bovids and anthropomorphs, and again, look the spiral shape over here. And another spiral that's uh, in the bottom left, and, and there is clear, clear connections to the, the rock art in the bottom of Purimukule. And so there, there is a um, uh, 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 sign out there, there is a cluster of rock art sites in this region. Pum uh, Kom Nu is a fairly known site, but uh, rather obscure in the eastern foothills of Purimukule. Uh, Kom Nu means uh, artwork or decoration, and, and the Komnu in this poem is, is this particular um, relief of Vishnu. Um, this is what I looked like in the 1970s, um, so not much of a difference, um, except uh, the build-up of the altar in this section and the vegetation here is cleared up a bit. Um, there are other carvings of Ganesha and Vishnu on the other side of this, of this um, boulder. Uh, and, and they've been discussed in, in uh, 1979 and recently, uh, I think 2008. Um, but the rock art that, that everyone seems to have missed is in between these two sets of carvings. So this, this giant red catfish, um, um, about a meter long, uh, everyone seems to have missed that. Uh, and also many small drawings, um, can't really see clearly here, and this is the best I can answer, I'm not sure if that, that's clear. 
I still need to work on that. But it, it looks like a small um, man or a turtle, still undecided. <coughs> but it's an interesting site because it's still a living site. People still go to uh, uh, Nu in the, in the New Year. They make offerings. Uh, forest monks regularly come to this to this shelter to meditate. And, and so there's this continuity uh, that seems to stretch from prehistoric times to, to the 12th century where the carvings are made and, and to today. And I'm wondering whether this continuity is uh, coincidence or confluence. Um, is it surprising that we find Rokka in Perungkulan, the, the most holy uh, site in Cambodia, and does Rokka indicate this long uh, period of occupation from, from start to finish? Uh, and and what, does it, what does it say about um, sacred sites in, in Southeast Asia, maybe? Uh, what we know as a sacred site now has always been a sacred site, it's just been uh, reconfigured uh, time over time. And there are quite a few sites in Southeast Asia that, that appear to have this continuity. So rock art, and then um, um, later they become converted to religious use. And I'm, I'm wondering whether this is just a, a coincidence or a confluence. And, and so I went to visit these sites uh, throughout the year to, to try, try and build a, a life history of sites. So starting from from Cambodia, we went north to uh, Korat. Kao um, uh, Chan Nam roughly translates to the mountain of the beautiful moon. Uh, this is the site as it is today. Uh, you can notice the, the rock at the top here. And then, of course, there's this, there's this shrine that's rather modern. Um, uh, or this, this is the point where I have to warn you that this is where the dead baby comes up. So if you're uncomfortable about the dead baby, or no one else, okay. Uh, on the other side, facing this altar, is this little shrine to, to uh, aborted babies. And that, that dead baby is that little thing in the jar. Anyone born before 1983 or after 1983? Uh, that's babies older than you. Uh, and that's a shrine to, to yeah. So that, that's a really modern shrine. The, the rock art is dated to about uh, 3,000 years old on the basis of the depiction of the dog. Um, uh, and, and, that, and the argument there, which Hayam makes, is that uh, dogs don't appear in the archaeological record before 3,000 years. So this site is at most 3,000 years old, and, and there's no other way to uh, excavate this site because of the shrine that's there now. But there's also a, 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 a large gap. Um, this, this shrine was only built in the 1960s. Uh, monks have only moved there during that time. Uh, and before that, um, they don't know of any settlement before, before monks have moved there. But they seem to be attracted to that site because it's a good place to meditate, it's a good place to get power from. So I'm not sure whether there's a there's a there's a coincidence at play here, but there's no there's no long period of, of continuity at this particular site. Uh, moving further north to Urantani province. Um, we have the site called Pu Prabhat, which means uh, the mountain of Buddha footprints. Uh, and it's very similar to Phnom Kulen. It's a sandstone temple. Um, these are Lan Chang period uh, temples, uh, so 18th century period temples, 19th century period temples, uh, housing uh, what is called a Buddha footprint. And there are like three or four Buddha footprints on this on this mountain itself. And this is what one of, one of those Buddha footprints is like. So the belief is that Buddha walked uh, walked through these spaces and he left uh, footprint behind and then they become uh, venerated over time. Um, these, uh, this mountain is also full of sandstone uh, shelters that later become converted into hermitages used by monks. So I um, actually got a cool video of this. Uh, this this, uh, this uh, shelter is about uh, five meters off the ground, it wasn't accessible. Uh, and we have many small pockets of rock art. So uh, over 100 rock art sites have been identified in this region uh, alone. Uh, the most famous of which is um, this, this uh, shelter called Tamken, or the Cave of Humans. And um, it looks as if the, the, the human figures are emerging from a hole in the ground, uh, which makes it uh, quite interesting. Um, so this entire, this entire mountain shows um, uh, evidence for a long continuous occupation as well. Um, and you find this um, occupation even in single specific sites, like this shelter called Tampra. It's a collapsed rock shelter, so you can see where 
where uh, the shelter has collapsed in this section, so it's flattened here. In this section, there is uh, Khmer style paintings. You can see some cinema here, boundary stones, and rock art underneath uh, this section of the roof that has collapsed. And today, it's located near a shrine, so people still go there to worship. So you have uh, Khmer style, or in Thailand, they call it the Lokpuri style carvings. Um, it's Khmer, it's really Khmer. And uh, uh, rock art here, we don't really see it clearly here, so let me show you. This is the, the rock art that appears. Sorry. Uh, a second site that's similar to this is uh, Wat Prabhat Waban, uh, the temple of uh, the Buddha footprints with the lotus plumes. With the lotus plume, okay? And again, we have uh, Khmer style or the Varavati style uh, boundary stones over here. Uh, nine sets of them, uh, eight sets of them, and um, they they lead up to this rock shelter here. So there's a long, nice path over there, where there is a modern Buddhist shrine uh, over there, uh, and you can still see some of the ancient boundary stones. They they replaced them over there, but recently they they put modern tiles, and this is obviously a, a modern Buddha statue. And behind behind this rock shelter, we find rock art. Very unexceptional rock art, but still rock art nonetheless. Um, and and the view from from this vantage point is is quite spectacular. This this is a, a so you can imagine this this uh, this is like a threshold area where you're coming through this clearing with the boundary stones, you're moving up to the shrine, and then beyond the shrine you just see this huge. Uh, you're basically at the edge of the mountain, and and over the horizon that's now over there, and it's, it's a very spectacular landscape. Uh, and I'm wondering what part this has to play with the, the whole idea of, of rock art and, and um, uh, Buddhist shrines coming together. And, uh, it's, it's still a, a, a work in progress. Moving up north to Lao, uh, in Long Prabang province, we have the Pakun Caves. Um, um, it's, it's a spectacular cave. Uh, it's about 30 kilometers north of Long Prabang, and a two, two hour boat right? It's a limestone cave system in the confluence of the Mekong and the Old River. And there are two caves, Tam Ting and Tam Tung. Tam Ting is this one that you see here. Uh, it's full of Buddha images, uh, 2,000, and at one point there were like 4,000 uh, images. And it's also the birthplace of Buddhism in Lao. It's, it's considered the, the birthplace of Buddhism in Lao. And it's full of people during the New Year. Uh, in the upper cave in Tam Tung, uh, it's, it's a very deep six-chambered cave uh, and we find rock art up here and over here. Um, so that's what the rock art looks like. And also in the first chamber, you find uh, this interesting piece of rock art, which, which looks very similar to uh, rock art that we find in Kelantan and uh, rock art that we find in China. I, I, I don't know whether this is just a coincidence at this part of time. Um, there's an interesting story to do at Lao. I didn't get permissions to, to work in Lao until 24 hours I came back to Singapore. So the best I could do was just go to these places as a tourist and take pictures. So I couldn't get uh, samples. But these paintings are black color. And if it's black, it might be charcoal. If it's charcoal, it might be datable. So that would be an interesting uh, thing to look at when I, when I go back. Um, and then uh, a last cave for comparison is the Paddling Cave. Um, and for the longest time, the only images that we had of Petalin Cave was uh, this, this journal article from the 1960s and some, some images from uh, Moan's uh, book on early aspects of Myanmar. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to produce these pictures of uh, Cave 1, uh, which, haven't, which, which no one has, has seen in entirety. But it's, it's a fairly well protected cave now. Uh, they put a fence there to protect people from the rock art. They put drip lines over there to protect um, uh, the rock art from being uh, inundated with water. And I think they've stabilized the rock art with a plastic coating, which uh, I don't really agree with, but it's better than nothing. Um, some of the, uh, oh, and notice there, of course, there's a, there's a pagoda uh, on the left. Um, and, and, but I, I found out that the pagoda was only built again in the 1950s. So it's similar to the Thai, the, the Thai example. It might be just a coincidence, but it's still a pretty cool place to go to. 
this is the rocket that we, we see there. So these are the first few images, proper images that we have from Adeline Cave. Uh, the the so-called sun image, and that's that's degraded quite a bit because if you see from the drawing, there's it's actually two two rounds, two rounds of, uh, and you only see one clear round of lines here. And this image here, um, the head's really degraded, but the old picture has uh, a better looking head. And so, and that's that's the reason you need proper recordings because uh, once rock art goes. It's gone. Um, so some of my preliminary observations from, from this study that I've been doing um, is that the sites that, I, that I've been going to, they tend to be described as prehistoric, um, either, either with, with dates like Paladin, they're, they're prehistoric, um, or because they just, they just uh, are similar to other prehistoric paintings in Southeast Asia. Um, but there are no direct dates. But uh, I'm not implying a connection between all these sites. Um, um, the, this prehistoric idea is further supported by the idea that local communities don't really know where these paintings come from. Um, they've, they've said they've always been there. Either that or uh, these communities have migrated into the region in, in, uh, in recent times or in times that we can remember. So there's no connection between uh, the local people who live at these places now with the rock out there. So it tends to indicate that the rock is older than them. Uh, for some reason, um, these, these places uh, are, are located on relatively high locations, all at least 100 meters above sea level. And I need to, I need to run through these locations for GIS to, to figure out what else is in common with them. Um, and for some reason, it's a place where forest monks tend to go to meditate. Or every one of these sites, uh, forest monks go there during the place to draw now. Uh, to meditate. And, and so there's this idea of power that does not seem to be associated with the rock art. When, when I ask uh, monks why they go there, they, the rock art doesn't come into the picture at all. And, and I'm wondering, so is this, is this a huge coincidence? Or again, but there's rock art there all the time. Uh, or, or maybe the, there's, there's something going on there which I need to, I need to, to, to read more about with, um, uh, with Buddhism. The, the, these sites also tend to be very, very good habitation sites. Um, the only problem is with the sandstone sites. They're all sandstone, so there's nothing to excavate, so there's no material to, to, to look up. Um, but with the limestone sites, they are, but uh, again, because these are all religious sites, they're, they're impossible to excavate at this point of time. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, uh, well, just about one hour. In conclusion, there is a lot of rock art in Southeast Asia. Uh, and and um, they need to be systematically recorded because uh, a recording is the basic thing you need to do uh, as a conservation measure. And it's really low cost. Um, you have to start looking at rock art and archaeological material, uh, not an artistic material. Um, yeah, and, and in short, I hope, I hope I've convinced you that there's a lot of potential to study rock art in Southeast Asia and, and um, a lot of potential research can be done. Uh, and that, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.